Shapes in the Clouds. I think I've always been an artist. Even as a baby, still clinging to my mother, I had an artist's eye. I saw shapes in the clouds and sculptures in the tumbled stones at the bottom of a stream. I grabbed at colors, the crimson flower just out of reach, the ebony bird streaking past. I don't remember much about my early life, but I do remember this. Whenever I got the chance, I would dip my fingers into the cool mud and use my mother's back for a canvas. She was a patient soul, my mother. Imagination. Someday I hope I can draw the way Julia draws, imagining worlds that don't yet exist. I know what most humans think. They think gorillas don't have imaginations, that we don't remember our past or ponder our futures. Come to think of it, I suppose they have a point. Mostly I think about what is, not what could be. I've learned not to get my hopes up. The loneliest gorilla in the world. When the Big Top Mall, mall was first built, it smelled of new paint and fresh hay. And humans came to visit from morning till night. They drifted past my domain like logs on the lazy river. Lately, a day might go by without a single visitor. Max says he's worried. He says I'm not cute anymore. He says, Ivan, you've lost your magic, old guy. You used to be a hit. Mr. Young to the front office, Mr. Young to the front office. It's true that some of my visitors don't linger the way they used to. They stare through the glass, they cluck their tongues, and they frown while I watch my TV. He looks lonely, they say. Not long ago, a little boy stood before my glass, tears streaming down his smooth red cheeks. He must be the loneliest gorilla in the world, he said. Clutching his mother's hand. At times like this, I wish humans could understand me the way I understand them. It's not so bad, I wanted to tell the little boy. With, with enough time, you can get used to almost anything. TV. My visitors are often surprised when they see the TV Mac put, on, put in my domain. They find it odd, the sight of a gorilla staring at a tiny humans in a box. Sometimes I wonder though, isn't it the way they stare at me sitting in my tiny box just as strange? My TV is old and it doesn't always work and sometimes days will go by before anyone remembers to turn it on. I'll watch anything, but I'm particularly fond of cartoons with their bright jungle colors. I especially enjoy it when somebody slips on a banana peel. Bob, my dog friend, loves TV almost as much as I do. He prefers to watch professional bowling and cat food commercials. Bob and I have seen many romance movies too. In romance, there's much hugging and sometimes face licking. I have yet to single, see a single romance starring a gorilla. We also enjoy old rest, Western movies. In the Western, someone always says, this town ain't big enough for the both of us, Sheriff. In a Western, you can tell who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, and the good guys always win. Bob says Westerners are nothing like real life. The Nature Show. I have been in my domain for 9,855 days, alone. For a while, when I was young and foolish, I thought I was the last gorilla on earth. I tried not to dwell on it. Still, it's start hard to stay upbeat when you think that there are no more of you. Then one night, after I watched a movie about men in black hats and guns and feeble-minded horses, a different show came on. It was not a cartoon, not a romance, not a western. I saw a lush forest. I heard birds murmuring, the grass moved, the trees rustled. Then I saw him. He was a bit threadbare and scrawny and not as good looking as I am, to be honest. But sure enough, he was a gorilla. As suddenly as he appeared, the gorilla vanished and in his place was a scruffy white animal called, I learned, a polar bear. And then a chubby water creature called a manatee. And then another animal and another. All night I was wondering about the gorilla I glimpsed. Where did he live? Would he ever come to visit? Is this, is there where, where he was somewhere? Could there be a she as well? Or was it just the two of us all in the world trapped in our own separate boxes? Stella. Stella says she's sure that there I will see another real life gorilla someday. And I believe her because she is even older than I am and has eyes like black stars and knows more than I will ever know. Stella is a mountain, next to her I am a rock, and Bob is a grain of sand. Every night when the store closes and the moon washes the world with the milky light, Stella and I talk. We don't have much in common, but we have enough. We are huge and alone, and we both love yogurt raisins. 
Sometimes Stella tells stories of her childhood, of leafy canopies hidden by mist and busy songs of flowering water. Unlike me, she recalls every detail of her past. Stella loves the moon with its untroubled smile. I love the feel of the sun on my belly. She says, it's quite a belly, my friend, and I say, thank you, so is yours. We talk, but not too much. Elephants, like gorillas, do not waste words. Stella used to perform in a large and famous circus, and she still does some of those tricks for our show. During one stunt, Stella stands on her hind legs while Snickers jumps on her head. It's hard to stand on your hind legs when you meet more, more than 40 men. If you are a circus elephant, you stand on your hind legs while a dog jumps on your head and you get a treat. If you do not, the claw stick comes swinging. Elephant hide is as thick as a bark on an ancient tree, but a claw stick can still pierce it like a leaf. Once Stella saw a trainer hit a bull elephant with a claw stick. The bull is like a silverback noble contained calm like a cobra is calm. When the claw stick caught in the bull's flesh, he tossed the trainer into the air with his tusk. The man flew, Stella said, like an ugly bird, and she never saw the bull again. Stella's trunk. Stella's trunk is a miracle. She can pick up a single pe peanut with elegant precision, tickle a passing mouse, or tap the shoulder of a dozing keeper. Her trunk is remarkable, but still it can't unlatch the door of her tumble-down domain. Circling Stella's legs are long ago star scars from the chains that she wore as her youth, her bracelets she calls them. When she worked at the famous circus, Stella had to balance on the pedestal for her most difficult trick. One day she fell off and injured her foot and she went lame and lagged behind the elephants. The circus sold her to Mac. Stella's foot never healed completely. She limps when she walks and sometimes her foot gets infected when she stands in one place for too long. Last winter, Stella's foot swelled to twice its normal size. She had a fever and she lay in the damp, cold floor of her domain for five days. They were very long days. Even now, I'm not sure she's completely better. She never complains though, so it's hard to know. At the Big Top Mall, no one bothers with iron shackles. A bristly t rope tied to a bolt on the floor is all that's required. They think I'm too old to cause trouble, Stella says. Old age, she says, is a powerful disguise. A plan. It's been two days since anyone's come to visit. Mac is in a bad mood. He says we are losing money hand over fist. He says he's going to have to sell the whole lot of us. When Thelma, a blue and yellow macaw, demands, kiss me big boy, for the third time in 10 minutes, Mac throws the soda can at her. Thelma's wings are clipped so she can't fly, but she still can hop. She leaps aside just in the nick of time. Pucker up, she says with a shrill whistle. Mac stomps to his office and slams the door shut. I wonder if my visitors have grown tired of me. Maybe if I learn a trick or two, it will help. Humans do seem to enjoy watching me eat. Luckily, I'm always hungry. I'm a gifted eater. A silverback must eat 45 pounds of food in a day if he wants to stay a silverback. 45 pounds of fruit and leaves and seeds and stem and bark and vines and rotten wood. Also, I enjoy the occasional insect. I'm going to try to eat more. Then maybe we'll get more visitors. Tomorrow I will eat 50 pounds of food, maybe even 55. That should make Mac happy. Bob. I explained my plan to Bob. Ivan, he says, trust me on this one. The problem is not your appetite. He hops on my chest and licks my chin, checking for leftovers. Bob is a stray, which means he does not have a permanent address. He is so speedy, so wily, the mall workers long ago gave up trying to catch him. Bob can sneak into cracks and crevices like a tracked rat. He lives well off the ends of hot dogs he pulls from the trash, and for dessert he laps up spilled lemonade and splattered ice cream cones. I've tried my share of food with Bob, but he's a picky eater and he prefers to hunt for himself. Bob is tiny, wiry, and fast, like a barking squirrel. He is a nut-colored and big-eared. His tail moves like weeds in the wind, spiraling, dancing. Bob's tail makes me dizzy and confused. It has meaning within the meaning, like human words. I am sad, it says. I am happy, it says. Beware, I may be tiny, but my teeth are sharp. Gorillas don't have the use for tails. Our feelings are uncomplicated. Our rumps are unadorned. Bob used to have three brothers and two sisters. Humans tossed them out of the truck of the freeway when they were only a few weeks old. Bob rolled into a ditch. The others did not. 
His first night on the highway, Bob slept in the icy mud of the ditch. When he woke, he felt so cold that his legs would not bend for an hour. The next night, Bob slept under some dirty hay near the Big Top Mall garbage bins. The following night, Bob found the spot in the corner of my domain where the glass is broken. I dreamed that I'd eaten a furry donut, but when I woke up in the dark, I discovered a tiny puppy snoring on top of my belly. It has been so long since I felt the comfort of another's warmth that I wasn't sure what to do. Not that I hadn't had visitors. Mac had been in my domain, of course, and many other keepers. I've seen my share of rats have passed, and the occasional wayward sparrow had fluttered in through the hole in my ceiling, but they never stayed long. I didn't move all night for the fear of waking Bob.